There we go. So here we are going live for an exciting webinar with Christian Thompson here. Um, just see there's a lot of people joining. So let's wait a tiny bit more. Um, we have got a lot of people here. Recognize a few names. Exciting. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today and um, trying to understand metabolic health and what is the meaning of metabolic health, because there's different meanings and many ways of interpreting it. Um, let's wait a tiny bit more. We have... Perfect. So let's start slowly. We have a lot of people here already. Anyway, all this will be recorded, so you will be able to access it later uh, on our channels. Um, but um, thank you first, Christian, for, for being here. Um, I'm very happy to be here today with Christian because Christian is a uh, top expert um, and functional health practitioner um, and have been working for decades now uh, into optimizing people's health. Um, and I'm very pleased as well to say that you're part of the Omnos team as our head of product um, since not too long ago, uh, but very exciting about that. And we are working on very exciting things together. So. Uh, today we're going to pick up your brain and for you to explain to everybody what is metabolic health, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and also presenting one of our tests which, which we have uh, that covers everything. But really going into the details of metabolic health and what can we do about it and what are the common things that we, you know, we can uncover from testing metabolic health um yeah so and over to you well you know th uh, thank you thomas for, for that introduction and uh yes i'm very happy to be here and, and discussing um a topic that is uh, definitely close to my heart it's metabolic health and uh, also um the, the special note of what this test can do is, as well as looking in terms of the environmental toxins uh or the toxins in our environment and how they may impact us i mean I know myself, it's a very strong part of my story. I think, Thomas, you said uh, that you as well, you had um, yeah, uh, so, a big part of uh, this so yeah, story exactly. as well. So it's very funny. It's, it comes back to actually the very beginning of Omnos. It wasn't even called Omnos yet. <laughs> I was still looking for the name, uh, but we're working very much on the algorithm. And I, before that, because it took many years to put together Omnos with, with the team, um, we, I was just remembering being so tired and really drained and, and very, you know, exhausted, but I just thought it was because of the, you know, hard work I was putting in. Um, but I knew it was also something probably to do with London and, and the pollution. But one thing we did is to do those tests and to see how it would look into our algorithm. Um, and I was very surprised to have my results, but really targeted pinpoint where the area, uh, and so on the toxins, where the area of problem were. And I had things like liver toxicity flashing. Um, and because of this liver to toxicity, I had low glutathione, uh, which funny enough, genetically I'm already predisposed to that because of phase one and phase two, certain genetic variants of GSTM1 and else, which are not optimal for me. So I was predisposed to that, but then to see from the on toxin test, but actually, yes, because you live in London and your car toxins, which is something we look into this test, were way beyond normal, like way beyond, it was like too scary, was depleting me of my glutathione and was also uh, damaging my liver. So I had liver toxicity really high. Uh, it was really uh, a bit of a call to see this, you know, um, just in front of me in black and white in, into our old version of Omnos, um, which, yeah, so it was a, quite eye-opening for me. Um, and yeah, so I've started taking, obviously, the, the, the step necessary to change that. Um, and yeah, it, it was exciting to see the difference. And then lockdown happened. Mm -hmm. um, and funny enough, when lockdown happened, I was actually far from London and literally in the middle of nowhere. And I worked really on detoxifying and not having this input again of uh, on the yeah. toxins. When I retest, all it was back to normal. And obviously all those symptoms like, you know, strong headaches I had, like very, very tired, 
um, all gone. So it was definitely the source of it I could see. So I was really proud already, like, wow, we've got something. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, removing environmental toxins, you know, obviously is a major step. I mean, it can be uh, the diff, it's like night and day in terms of difference in people's energy and people's uh, capacity for life in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, uh, my story myself is like, you know, I was a former world champion kickboxer uh, and doing all that with heavy metal poisoning, um, mercury poisoning was my was my main thing originally. Um, and I could uh, uh, constantly getting sicker and sicker until I dealt with that problem. Now, you know, uh, there was many different tests and, and lots of sort of trial and error process I went through during that period of resolving my own health. But um, a story I can tell more about the relation to the pollution was I drive a motorbike around. Uh, well, I was at that point driving a motorbike around everywhere. These days it's a little bit more, a little more of a fair weather rider. But uh, uh, you know, don't, don't tell anyone. <laughs> right? But um, uh, driving around with you know just like petrol fumes in your face all day, I you I could suddenly feel my energy levels dropping, that fatigue coming back that I'd once experienced during you know uh, that sort of chronic fatigue syndrome that I'd experienced in the past. And um, just simply by putting a filter uh, on over my mouth, so uh, just because you couldn't drive around with the lid down all the time uh, when you drive around London, you know, fog fog up the visor and things like that sometimes. So, you know, having a having a, a proper pollution filter mask, wearing that as I drove around London, actually suddenly reversed the symptoms almost instantaneously. So one of the first steps is recognizing where the where, where those toxins may be coming from in your environment and removing them. Uh, you know, there's, there's never going to be a better mitigating step than that. There can be a few of them, right? So I, I, yeah. I mentioned car toxins, but I also had water toxins, which mm -hmm. I was like, I don't understand because I'm actually drinking mineral water. Mm -hmm. But of course, not being uh, full of myself because I was really, you know, tired. Yes, of course I drink in bottled water, but my coffee, but I get to the <laughs> coffee place or else I'll not. And and I could see the water toxin as, as well, but significantly high. Um, so it's very interesting to see. Yeah. And then, right, let's dive in yeah. um, and, and explain to us what is metabolic health. Uh, and then we'll come back into the test itself. But first let's yeah. understand the whole concept. Yeah. So like metabolism is a, is a very vast topic. Now, uh, the first thing to understand is it's not just, you know, how many calories you burn, or how fast you like so people talk about fast and slow metabolism all the time. So like that and people refer to calories. Now, calories are, are a man made construct. You know, they don't really exist. Um, they're just a measurement of how much how how much energy it takes to change water by a degree. Um, so metabolism is realistically the process that any molecule or chemical goes through um, within uh, any pathway of the body. So a cell will, will, will turn glucose into pyruvate. That's a metabolic pathway. The metabolism of glucose to pyruvate is the metabolism of glucose. You know, now, metabolism as a whole is every single metabolic pathway in the body. So it can be quite a, you know, uh, an all-encompassing uh, subject. For us to for us to go around, I, I, I think you you've uh, given me a little bit of a poll here. It's come up on my screen as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, so everybody has a poll. Sorry, I should have yeah. one. Yeah. I'm going to throw a poll. <laughs> There's two two questions will be coming there. Uh, yeah. So feel free to answer the poll and uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, have I got it's taking me off my. Oh, there we go. I, I've got control of the screen back again now. <laughs> right. And so, like, you know, the base, the, the, the basics of metabolism um, is understanding that every process, while it may happen at random um, over time, there are specific enzymes that speed those processes up. And now those enzymes are workers like the engines of those pathways and will often dictate how well or or how fast those pathways operate so when you can have a uh, like saying you have a fast metabolism is an is an idiom it's it, it's something that people have sort of colloquialized into saying right well are you are you you know uh, are you able to eat loads of food and not put on weight um with uh, or are you or, or are you not able to eat much unless uh, and if you do eat more you will put on weight so that's what people are really friends with slow and fast metabolism, and it's not really, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not really how things truly work. 
So, and it, it gets people into sticky situations when they consider their health and they're trying to get these results because they're looking at things from a very like, you know, abstract or skewed angle from what they are in reality. So, you know, you can have one pathway that speeds up and one pathway that slows down. And that can create that response that we were just talking about there about being able to consume more food and not put on weight, which is actually something that's more to do with central nervous system regulation and something slightly actually outside of what this topic today is on. Um, but these pathways, understanding how they work and the understanding the enzymes that, that basically control the speed of them is a very important uh, part of understanding of metabolic health as a whole. And they definitely do impact on so many areas of our life. In fact, one of the main things we're talking about is the liver, which is a, a, a very big central sort of controlling system within our sort of visceral organs that would dictate how and when a lot of things occur within our body. You know, so some of the, some of the bullet points we've, we've got here is, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, pathways interact, control the balance of growth and breakdown of tissues. Now, this one bullet point here particularly is uh, extremely important for, for understanding how health and how disease develops. Um, there was a, there was a coining a phrase um, from uh, a friend of mine way back who got it from uh, someone else uh, who said this throughout history. Uh, is a thing of a famous osteopath or something that uh, you know this disease is just dis ease. You know, not being at ease. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got this idea of when things start to break down, that's when disease starts to occur, and these pathways will dictate that. So. We've got anabolic and catabolic phases. Anabolic building up of things. So like when you say build your muscle and catabolic say when you break things down. So catabolic can be, and anabolic can both be positive and negative. You know, if you have something called hyperplasia, which is an anabolic process where you start increasing the size of certain organs to a, a degree where it's not healthy anymore, then that can be a very unhealthy thing to do. A uh, catabolic process would be breaking down fat stores, which often is what people are actually seeking to do. So it's not that either one of these things are bad or good. We always have to understand that these things, uh, they, when, if they happen when they're meant to be happening, that's a good thing. And if they happen when they're not meant to be happening, that's a bad thing. So it's not really the pathway or the speed or the direction it's moving. It's more about the context and the timing yeah. of, this, of this movement. And this is what a lot of this sort of test can sort of start getting us to understand is are the timing mechanisms off? Are the, are the intensities of the pathways off? You know, and where can we, what can we do to support or change that? So another, another uh, uh, bullet point here is that each pathway can steal or give away resources. And the, all these pathways interact and are exchanging metabolites all the time. Metabolites is just another word for resources. Resources could be anything from an amino acid such as a protein, yes, uh, or a vitamin or a mineral like, you know, mm -hmm. iron, zinc, you know, uh, vitamin C, B1, B9, B12, you know, the common things people are generally looking to try and improve or change. So when we look at our metabolism, we've really got to look at these things as a whole. Now, so this next slide. Most people are here. <laughs> Before everybody gets yeah. too scared, yeah. it's just to show what a pathway is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this, uh, is, this is just a visual representation of the pathways. Don't worry, you don't need to, a chemistry degree yeah. to understand this. Well, all. very, very complex being, and, and this is yeah. what we're trying to do in, in our MOS, is to simplify mm. things, but to all those things to make it accessible for everyone in a way people understand. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is, this is one of the pathways. Yeah, so, so this, this, this picture is like an amalgamation of a couple really interesting pathways. We've got how we process glucose, we've got how we process fats. We've got a pathway that relates to both of those pathways called the pentophosphate pathway. But more importantly, we've got the, the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle in the middle here of this image. And these uh, sort of furate, malate, ox, uh, oxalacetate, citrate, isocitrate, these, these sort of metabolites that make up this pathway, we can directly measure them along with pyruvate and, and lactate and a number of other, other things on this screen to see how these, uh, how these metabolic pathways are interacting and whether you know, we are processing glucose uh, appropriately or if there's a major issue with processing glucose, more to the point. And you know, these can tell us many things. Even if we're suffering from heavy metals, there's a potential to see this from some of these pathways. 
based on how the heavy metals may impact the enzymes, for example. So if we skip ahead, you know, from our, uh, in our chemistry lesson to like enzymes, what they are and how they work. First thing I just need to understand is enzymes basically work by combining different substrates or different uh, sort of chemical molecules in the body. So say you have um, an enzyme that's going to do a job, it may need uh, zinc and, uh, and, and vitamin C or zinc and a B vitamin to actually ex to do its job. So what the enzyme physically does is it increases the speed of that reaction. So we have here the energy it takes to, to, for the reaction to occur. And therefore, you know, for that reaction to occur at random is going to be very slow. So the enzyme basically reduces the energy needed for that reaction to occur, to, occur, to allow that reaction to happen faster. Now, when we have certain um, resources such as vitamins and minerals that act as cofactors, they end up speeding these reactions up or making these enzymes work more efficiently. And when we have certain toxins in our environment, they may actually slow these enzymes down and inhibit them from working. So they may take up one of the spaces in a way that stops the enzyme working, or you may have yeah. something that takes a space up within the enzyme that makes it work faster or just makes it work in general. So all these sorts of things can happen. And this is the reason why these changes would occur. And that's the reason why we can see what we can see in this test. So I think realistically, that's the main technical part out of the way. So now we know why and how we can actually draw this information from the test, which is important in itself to validate what we're, what we're going to say next and how we're going to sort of see our way through the next stages. But next, we're going to have a, have a little look on the impact of the overall health uh, that uh, some of these things can have as well. So uh, obviously a big, uh, there's, there's two big concerns for people a lot of the time is uh, the toxins in their environment. You know, uh, it's especially in the more biohacking world, people are very aware of how, how many things might actually cause a negative response for our health. And, you know, many people in the modern world are, are concerned about their metabolic function, you know, uh, you know, uh, how's their thyroid operating? Are they, are they tolerating foods well enough? You know, you know, or, or, you know what, what's the reason why they feel like they're doing everything right and things just aren't working? You know, where, where do we find the answers to those questions? So one of the, one of the things we can look at, is the, like we said before, is environmental toxins, you know, and, uh, here are some of the basic toxins on the left-hand side of the screen um, that we may come into in, in even in, in very commonly in modern-day worlds. And, and uh, a, lot of the, lot of the, a lot of the toxins we test for as well within the Envirotox test. So, you know, organic solvents, you know, that can come from anything like some glues, to like, uh, like uh, especially anyone doing stuff with metal works, you know, uh, heavy metals, which could be anything from uh, seafoods to uh, mercury amalgams, depending on how they're put in, and uh, a lot, the whole whole I <laughs> think whole uh, webinar on that alone. And um, you know, uh, fuel additives, so you know, or, or 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 exhaust fumes. You know, are you working in or in and around these sorts of petroleum-like substances, or are you experiencing them in your environment in a regular basis? Cosmetic additives, you know, cosmetic products in general and cleaning products. You know, I know, I know lots of people have had major environmental toxins coming from either cosmetic products they were using or cleaning products they were using. So that some people uh, have, a, have a very rigorous cleaning routine and they use some very strong chemicals in their cleaning routines. Yeah. And it creates, it can, not always, but it can create some adverse health events. So, you know, being mindful of all these things and even, even pesticides, you know, Pesticides are probably more, more of the common one that most people come into contact on a daily basis. And just doing simple steps like washing your fruits and vegetables before you eat them, um, one, uh, either in um, sort of bicarbonate or baking soda or um, glycine. There's a simple amino acid called glycine. It's fairly cheap to get. You warm water and some glycine or warm water and some bicarbonate and you wash your food in it. Um, it would normally like cling on to and, and uh, attach to those pesticides on the skin of the food and take them off with, uh, with, uh, with more ease. So it's not just like running them under a warm, warm water and expecting the, the pesticides yeah. to come off. They won't often come off too well if you do it that way. Often you need to soak them or, or wash them within a medium, just like you have to wash 
fat off something with soap that breaks it up. Same thing can happen with these chemical, with, with these, with, with, with bicarbonate and with glycine to pesticides as well. Um, I don't know if some of these uh, symptoms look familiar to you, Thomas. Yes. Um, I mean, for, for my own experience, again, the funny thing I realize is, uh, as I said, I moved out of London and I was no longer into um, the toxic environment of the car cubes. But I happened to be in the countryside and I, my pesticide went up. <laughs> so it was actually interesting to see that, okay, well, where do I go now? <laughs> um, but yes, again, it's, it's, it's about uh, making sure of, you know, the, the prevention side of thing is, uh, you know, try to control the thing you can control first. And it, it, most of the time it's enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously you cannot control the car fumes, but if you can control try to avoid the car fumes when you can and try to do the, the proactive steps to remove them, uh, whether it's through your lifestyle, sauna and all those different things, sweating things out and supporting the detox pathways, it will make a difference. And so what we're going to see anyway. Yeah, well, like, like you said, like, you know, driving with the window up or like you're or wearing a, a filter or something like that, if it's like a motorbike, like my, my situation, there's another one actually, which is uh, on, we, we test for is the plastic. And yeah. I am now always, you know, lying here. I'm always yeah. drink, drinking, I always drink by the bottle, uh, which I'm being told of all the time. Um, but glass, right? And and before I was doing that from plastic, and the plastic were really high. And now that I do that from the bottle, it's gone, which is yeah. amazing. But we don't really think about, okay, this is plastic bottle. It's been sitting somewhere in a warehouse, probably had some on and out. The, the, yeah. the molecule particle go into this water, uh, and then you drink it, and then yeah. it, it ends up in your body. Well, it's also, you know, when, once we understand which toxins are high and how... Uh, and you know, if we if we're looking at the envir uh, the envirotox test by itself, or if we're looking at it in conjunction with other blood tests or other um, uh, like uh, the hormones tests, like the saliva and urine tests, for that, um, how how our liver is responding to things? You know, what what is our glutathione status? You know, what is our cysteine or, or our sulfur status? You know, within our body, you know, how how is how is our body processing? Do we have enough glycine in our liver to process a number of toxins uh you know uh, is phase one how, and what we're going to get onto in a moment is talking about phase one phase two phase three detoxification from the liver and what that really means and mm -hmm. and how we can control that and uh, and uh, what sort of effects that might have uh, you know because that's also very important to take into account it's not just looking at where the, you know what toxin is high you know it's looking at how is the body responding to that because you could technically have a very strong robust system is managing to deal with a high level of, to of one toxin or another toxin. Yeah. Very well. we and yeah. we all have a different context from what, when this happened, right? You can be on top of your game and, you know, top performance, or you can already be uh, um, quite weakened by, I don't know, autoimmune diseases or things mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, again, it, it's a different outcome uh, from where you are already. So... Yeah, completely. And, th and this is why, you know, uh, it, you can't just have a one plus one equals two situation when it comes to human health. We, the, the context is so important and so unique, even though we te we're technically genetically not that different. We're made of all the same parts, but those parts have all been through their own very unique experience of life. And that's that's where that's, that's what we really love about, right? Comes. Because we, we do that. Right. So we yeah. really try to. Uh, starting by your self-assessment to understand where you're coming from, to then understanding about your genetic, what you are made of, and then looking at those tests, say, okay, what's the, the story now? And then when you start connecting the dots between everything, you really realize to I, say, oh, okay, yeah, there's a story I, and there's a source. Yeah, I think it's a really good point as well to make, you know, you, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, that you had some genetic snips that related to glutathione weakness or glutathione susceptibility. If I didn't have deletion in yeah. GSTM1, which is a yeah. phase two detoxification, maybe it will be a different story. Yeah. And but, uh, probably you have more glutathione. But, it's, uh, but the, the, the important thing is, you know, when you, you know, you can look at genes and they can tell you a risk factor for you having uh, more problems or less problems with, the, with this thing or that thing. But, you know, having to look at real life data on top of that to see where those risks are actually being expressed in reality 
is also a very important thing because your, your genes can tell you you are good at one thing or bad at one thing or you should be able to tolerate one thing or not able to tolerate another thing. But then when you look behind the scenes, when you look behind you know, under the hood, in reality, we see, actually, I'm struggling with this, but not with that. You know, and we can see where those risk profiles are actually presenting themselves in real world life and deal with those in a much more uh, strong, uh, strong manner. So we can take any issues that are, are com compounded by genetic uh, relationships more seriously, or we can take issues where, uh, where, where they're not compounded by genetic, uh, genetic issues and there's no symptoms relating to it less seriously. So it's about looking at those trifecta of things. You know, what, what's your symptoms? What's your genetics? And what's happening in real life with your objective markets? Yeah. Once we have all three of those angles, we can get much more. Actually into yeah. more uh, deeper. Yeah. But um, yeah, so the next thing I want to come across is you know some of the pathways that we uh, that we can look at. Um, so just just a, a basic example here. Um, we've got some of the B vitamins, which we'll we'll all look at within the. Um, Within the virotoxin test, and you know some of the, some of the pathways that they may impact. You know, uh, B1 is a huge one. You know, for glucose utilization, lots of people who suddenly they go, oh, it's so second I eat more than thirty grams of carbs, I you know I I, I have fatigue, I have flat out, I can't, I've got a headache, but this problem or that problem. Often it's because they got B1 deficiency. That is a really interesting story about how uh, B1 deficiency was the first ever nutrient deficiency to be a rich person's disease. And that was in Japan because they were polishing all of the husks off of the rice to have polished rice. And that was like, you know, the rich, the rich person at the time is food. But that was getting rid of all the nutrients around the husk and they had high carbohydrate, low nutrient, low B1 intake. And they created like very berry and Vernicki's brain and things like this, all these B1 deficient conditions within the rich populations because of this practice, um, but you know, uh, B2 often very under un, underrated in terms of nutrient deficiencies. Uh, lots of people focus around methylation, and they're going, "Oh, we need B9, B12, you know, uh, even choline, things like this, trimethylglycine." And we're going right, but actually, a lot of the research is showing now that you know, B2 is probably a more important uh, cofactor towards methylation than B9 and B12, for example. So. You know, making sure our B2 status is in a good place is very important. And we've spoken about glutathione quite a lot of times. And without adequate B6, you can't actually create glutathione naturally, realistically. So, um, you know, all of these things can come into, a, come into an account when we're looking at them. We're going, right, well, you know, uh, we have symptoms of poor methylation or we have maybe something else that says our methylation is poor. But when we look at our B9 and B12, they seem fine. We go right. Well, look, what's B2 doing? And the same thing, you know, we might have um, decent glutathione levels in our in 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 our urine, but um, we look at B6, and we look at B5, and we look at a few other things. We say, right, well, there's they're quite low, and this might explain why we're having symptoms every time we, you know, go through any form of stress or we get any form of additional um, requirements in the system. So when we have transient fatigue periods or when we have these sorts of um, uh, very hard to pin down symptoms sort of come and go as they please with no real rhyme or reason, often what we're looking for in these sorts of tests are patterns that may explain why something appears and disappears at, at what seems to be its own whim. So often understanding these nutrient cofactors is a very, very important step to understanding the overall process in more, in, with, with, with more uh, comprehension. Good. Um, risk factors for, you know, uh, causing issues within the metabolism, uh, toxins particularly. Um, oh, sorry, I've got my little voting thing come up again. And um, yeah, risk factors for these things. Um, often people are surprised when I say coffee is a risk factor. Um, that's mainly due to its effects in the liver, you know, and it's not a risk factor for everyone, but it can, can cause issues of congestion of the liver and changing the speed of how the liver processes things as well. Um, but alcohol, recreational, prescription drugs, they're obviously very uh, obvious why they might cause a problem in the liver. 
but what people think less of is coffee, alcohol, and all, all forms of drugs, realistically, are very large B vitamin depleters as well. So if anyone's having an issue with B vitamins, they've got to think twice about you know, the, the, the amount of coffee they're consuming and, um, and, and also those other substances as well. Um, um, another thing that well, most people understand high fructose corn syrup and high fructose things in general put strain on the liver and they, they create that they, they get a, a larger risk of things like fat, the fatty liver developing. But one thing that's very commonly used um, in, in people's health programs um, is uh, curcumin or turmeric like substances. And um, now, while it's a great anti inflammatory. It also slows down phase one uh, detoxification of the liver. So, the, within the liver, you have three phases of detoxification that occur. Phase one, which is sort of the breaking down of these metabolites, you know, the sort of taking things apart, taking things off them. And you've got phase two, which is the conjugation, where you put uh, new molecules back onto them to make them less toxic. And phase three, which is the excretion of them through bile and urine. So, Depending on what we need within our own uh, in individual profile. So if we've got a large amount of toxins in our environment and that we're showing a high, high amount of toxins being processed in our, our, in, through our urine and we have no problem in phase two detoxification. So we have all of those individual metabolites that will come, up, come around to speaking about later um, and that's all fine. Slowing our phase one down is only actually going to increase the level of damage that those toxins are going to, in, to incur on us. So, you know, taking something like curcumin could be a really bad idea. Whereas something like vitamin C would speed up phase one, you know, and vitamin C could, if speeding up phase one and you didn't have enough resources to allow phase two to work properly, could also be equally a bad idea because you just create a, additional congestion in the liver. So, you know, getting to understand where the liver is and its processing ability is also a very, very big step to understanding how we deal with metabolic health in general, especially at toxins. You know, uh, like this idea that we can go on a detox diet and solve everything uh, is uh, uh, famous, famously ridiculed for, for good reasons, although that, that ridicule has, has also led to people just throwing out any form of uh, ideology in around supporting our detoxification systems, which is completely bonkers because if we don't have the resources to make those pathways work, they're not going to work right. So metabol your metabolism within the liver and the detox pathways can speed up and they can slow down. That is factual. Do but you mean <laughs> drinking juice doesn't work. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, it may help hydrate you, but uh, I mean, that's, uh, and maybe you'll get some good vitamins and minerals out of it, but you know, it's, it's going to be abstract. Like, you know, when people say, oh, eat beetroot and artichoke, you know, for liver detox, it's like, yeah, that's really good at stimulating phase three. They, they're technically called secretagogues. So basically they, they, they particularly improve the secretion of, of bile, you know, and that can be a very, very good way of improving your ability to emulsify fats and improving your bile metabolism. Uh, all sorts of benefits that come from that. But you have to be aware of the of all the re repercussions that might come across. You know, uh, if we if we don't want to increase blood flow to the liver, then beetroot may not be the best idea because uh, you know also all the egmentine and the and its ability to, within beetroot and its ability to create vasodilation. It's a very strong vasodilator. That so. Well, often, and uh, it, it depends, you know, do we want to increase blood flow in general? Do we want to increase it in the liver? Do we want to increase blood flow in the intestines? Because all those things may be a, a, a response to having something that causes vasodilation. And so, yeah, all very interesting and like, you know, small, fine details that may come into uh, importance for each individual context that we're under, which I'm sure the, the people listening are sort of getting. Uh, getting the message at this by this point that you know context is the most important um well, i've seen a, a few notes coming through here are you are you watching the chat box here thomas yeah good um uh, yeah 
I think we've, I think we've covered that. Uh, you, you know, eating out of plastic containers, as we were saying before, you know, and especially if you're heating any food in plastic containers, <clears throat> as Thomas noted before, like about water bottles, you don't know how they've been stored and how, they, how they've been transported, whether they've, got, they've been left in the sun at any point in time. Anything in plastic that gets heated, anything that gets heated in general, um, can uh, sort of leak its, it, its own contents. So, for example, you know, cooking in iron or copper cookware is a way of treating iron and copper deficiency in, uh, in, in countries where they can't afford supplements. Yeah. And, you know, plastic is no different you know, to, to that. So, you know, anything that's heated up. Plastic, plastic uh, doesn't cure anything. Well. <laughs> you don't yeah. have that in your body, but, but the only also, if you're cooking with copper or iron uh, cookware and you have copper or iron excess, that also can be fairly dangerous. Right. But, um, you know, so, you know, everything, everything in context is, is the truth, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, oh, read. Solutions. Um, use of protective equipment uh, around toxic chemicals often is, you know, uh, and or, or just removing yourself from the environment of toxic chemicals. Um, it, often some of the biggest things we can do about toxins um, and most important things we should be doing about toxins in general. Sometimes that all isn't always um, an option, you know, like cleaning your house, it's not really an option. So, you know, changing to less toxic alternatives, you know, uh, again, this is a very big thing in the biohacking world. And in, gen uh, in general, people have become more and more aware of health and of the potential negative impact that various chemicals that have in our bodies. There's so a bracket here in, in, in when you get the result through the platform, we go quite granular and tell you what needs to be changed. Yeah. Um, because obviously it's based on yourself and your context and then tell you what sort of product you could use or do, uh, things to avoid and things to take sometime. Yeah, and, and this is the biggest thing, right? You know, so the, the democratization of health, as, as you've put it to me a few times, uh, is you know getting this automated system. So you don't need to pay uh, someone, uh, someone is uh, like myself, who can, who, you know, depending on how much time you take of mine, can become quite expensive, you know, to really get the full uh, full overview of everything and you know and uh, hand handheld all the way through and research of which products to change to and everything like that. Having an automated system that allows you to cut a lot of that work out, you know, a lot of work can very easily be automated, to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, take, take that work from the practitioner and put it into a, an automated system. It's an extremely powerful way to do things. Also, a lot of time saving for me because the things I enjoy doing are definitely not researching which cleaning product you should be using. Uh, that uh, bores me to death. But, uh, you know, looking at the, the fine detailed results, doing the things that only someone can do, that's something where I'm more interested. In. That's where something that practitioners should be doing. And that's the reason why people should be cost, uh, charging larger amounts of money for something is because it's a skill that can only be done by a person. You know, but a lot of these automated tasks, I think it's really important that we get more of this sort of stuff out into the world. So we allow a larger community of people to engage uh, in better behaviors and healthier habits. Um, avoiding so working on. Yes, bit by bit, step by step. Uh, yeah, uh, fil uh, filter your water, use glass containers, avoid plastic containers where possible, never heat food in plastic containers, eat a balanced diet in high in micronutrients. I always say to people, if people want to lose weight, the simplest way you can put it, is we have uh, energy and we have resources, okay? If we have something that's, uh, or energy and resources, two, two bars that would go parallel to each other. And if we have something that's high in energy and low in resources, that's gonna make you put on weight. If you have something that's low in energy and high in resources, that's gonna make you lose weight. And in here, we're talking energy means calories and resources mean micronutrients such as vitamins and minerals. It's a very simple process. If you follow that process, nine out of ten times you're going to lose weight yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the same i always had the same yeah. thing right it's, it's about upping the the micronutrients and you cannot go wrong really if you eat rich food in micro micronutrients sorry rich in nutrients in general um you know you you actually cannot really feel unsatisfied after a meal because your body already has all the nutrients it needs um, yeah. And you don't have things that are empty of, you know, nutrients and rich in calorie or really high in calorie. 
you will need to eat more and more because you will not satisfy this micronutrient intake. Yeah, completely. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, and, that could be another uh, webinar. And, Let, yeah, let's, let's move and, on. And, and, <laughs> whole other webinar I can do on central nervous system regulation and around calories and metabolism and how, you know, metabolic rate doesn't work the way you, way you think it does. You know, as you know, I specialize in metabolic analysis. It's a whole nother right. test, whole nother set of tools, you know, but we won't go there today. Um, uh, so yeah, support, supporting glutathione production is a huge thing in, ter in terms of your metabolic health. Glutathione is so tightly uh, linked to pretty much every almost every reaction in the body you know it, it's it's it, you know glutathione and b12 are very closely linked with the glutathione and you know and your circadian rhythm are intrinsically linked right you know uh, you know the glutathione um, changes within glutathione states so you can have glutathione in multiple different oxidized or reduced states it's, this is another thing I can relate actually because my glutathione was literally zero yeah. <laughs> uh, when I did the first test and I already was wearing this aura ring and I tracked my sleep. Um, and when I sorted this out, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, I was getting crown, you know, when you, yeah. you get the crown and the aura ring every single day and, and my HRV, everything. Yeah. And I think a big part was linked to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like it's, it's directly linked to our uh, original circadian system comes from glutathione uh, redox status, which is basically when we, we strip parts of glutathione or add parts back to it, which is redu oxidation and reduction respectively. Um, but that's our first form of circadian biology. And then the, then the changes towards light came second. Okay, So yeah. one of the main things that alter that is actually vitamin C. You know, and vitamin C is very important. It's one of the only molecules that can also regenerate some of the H4, which is involved in a lot of things as well. But, you know, looking after this sort of uh, methionine, cysteine, protein status, B6, is very important around glutathione. And most people will have a positive response from vitamin C. There are some scenarios where that's not going to be the right thing, but, you know, most in general, vitamin C is going to do people a very good job at helping produce more glutathione because it stimulates the right pathway for that um, and supports a lot of the similar processes that glutathione is used for. Um, supporting phase two and liver, uh, phase two and phase three liver detoxification. So, um, uh, 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 is it, are, we, are we on for an hour today, Thomas? Sorry? Uh, we on for 45 minutes to an hour, yes. All oh, right, well, yeah, we're going to go over a little bit. Apologies. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, do some uh, question at the end. Yeah, yeah. So uh, phase two, um, like I said before, it's conjugation. So there's, there's, you know, some people say it's five pathways, some people say it's seven pathways. It depends whether you want to separate each amino acid into a different pathway or not. And then you can go even further than seven pathways, to this, or whether you just want to call an amino acid pathway as one pathway. But you add various amino acids to toxins to make them less toxic. Uh, toxic. You can add um, a, a, an acetyl group. You can add glutathione. You can add a methyl group. You can add uh, a, a, a sort of a sulfur group. There's all these different pathways where we add something to it to make it less toxic so we can actually excrete it through phase three. So making sure that we have enough of, of, of nutrients like the ones listed here um, are very important. Glycine is probably one of the most important for many, many standard toxins and especially um, uh, pesticides. You know. Uh, a, a glypho glyphosate is a very similar molecule to glycine and therefore interrupts a lot of the glycine related processes. It's a uh, glycine acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter as well. So there's loads of processes glycine is involved. So just in, in, a, in a very simple way, like very simple way, yeah. which is not always the right thing for, for this, but <laughs> it's really those elements will deactivate this reactive compounds so then can move from phase two to phase three and the same happens in phase one right yeah so just so, to explain this yeah phase one they don't always get less toxic sometimes yeah. so phase one will either activate or deactivate something you know if it activates it then you know it may come back to phase one and be deactivated by by the similar process or it may most like of the car fumes will not be yeah. deactivated in phase one they no, no. A bit so, more work. yeah <laughs> sometimes uh, phase one will actually change it to be a more toxic chemical mm -hmm. so phase two can interact with it so there's also something also considerations to, towards timing of how fast can something get from phase one to phase two 
how fast can those enzymes, those reactions occur? And you know, how saturated are those reactions? So if you have, say, you know, a fully saturated glycine uh, conjugation response, and then you've got this other toxin that's come in that needs, needs access to glycine to become detoxified or less toxic, and it has to wait, then that is going to start causing damage in your liver before it gets uh, before it gets processed. So you know, understanding where your phase two is is very important to understand whether you want to slow down phase one or speed it up. Yeah. You know? So yeah. supporting phase two is very very important to make sure it has all the resources it needs to do the job it needs to do. And then phase three often does need some help and support. So these these things are often very very important nutrients in terms of helping with that. You know, phosphatidylcholine, taduka, beetroot, nacho, all have very strong implications on bile metabolism. So how we take fat-soluble toxins out of the liver and store them in the gallbladder as bile and release them during digestive processes. Um, astragalus, um, artichoke, and beetroot have good implications on urination as well in terms of secretions. So, you know, they're also good for making sure that you keep the flow of toxins moving out of your body as well. So there are lots of considerations that might mean someone needs to take more of one thing or less of another, but general, these are very good nutrients to, to, allow, to get people to be having more of, you know, to support mm -hmm. the liver detoxification in general. Um, so where, uh, where am I at? Where I am at? So, um, you know, uh, understanding, you know, what the Envirotox test does or, or organic acids test does, plus the environmental toxins aspect of it, which is why it's called Envirotox with Omnos, um, does is laid out fairly simply here, you know, gives a good understanding of the strain caused by bacteria and fungi. So something we haven't talked about at all yet is how we can look at the metabolism of the microbiome. So how these bacterial or these, these microbial elements are processing nutrients and impacting our, uh, the toxins or the related metabolites within our, our blood, you know, that, that can all be tested through urine metabolites as well. So they will, you know, there will be an exchange of metabolites between our microbiome and between our blood. These things constantly exchanging and that's how, that's how we can look at this sort of thing. A strong evaluation of vitamin status. Now, it's not every vitamin, but it's it's a it's a strong profile of them, and it can give us functional aspects of how they're being processed in metabolism. For, for example, you I would never ever use a blood sample to look at B5. I would only ever use a blood a, a urine sample to look at B5 because it, it, you you you're constantly going to have a good amount of B5 circulating in your blood. If you if you didn't, you'd probably be uh, very very sick. And um, so looking at the amount that's being expelled is always about 20% of your total stores. And therefore, sometimes a urine analysis is actually better to understand stores of a vitamin in your system rather than looking at the amount circulating in your blood. Mm -hmm. Again, context is king in these things. Um, assessing metabolic function, it reveals environmental toxin load, insights into liver function, as we've discussed fairly, uh, fairly, fairly well, a uh, good indication of methylation status as well. Um, provides an assessment of protein need and metabolism. So some of these uh, metabolites can give us indication that there may be genetic issues in processing protein or whether there's enough protein in the system in general, you know, whether we functionally just don't have enough amino acids. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, amirotoxin is a very, very complete snapshot of your metabolism yeah. um, and we cover 76 markers, uh, so it's a lot, and 20 of the environmental toxin. So 20 of the toxins like caffeine and all those different things. So it's, it's, it is quite a lot to a very good snapshot of the interaction between those things. Yeah, and uh, one and, and a simple thing like this, like oxalates, for example, can, can play a large role in many things. But what, one of, one of the, the contraindications for vitamin C could technically be a high oxalate level. But it gives us three measurements of how oxalates are produced in the body. So we can see more directly where the problem is coming from. Is it because we're consuming too much or is it because we're not excreting enough or we're producing too many oxalates? So, you know, or we're not processing them well enough. So we can see where they're coming from and how we need to tackle that. Um, whereas you may get, say, a microbiome test and it will show you an oxalate reducing uh, bacteria and that might be low and we might expect or we might have oxalate problems. If we consume a lot of oxalates, we'll probably have some problems. 
And so, you know, you might need to take calcium citrate, whereas this will give you a bit more of a, a, a profile, a, a complete view of oxalate. You know, but then microbiome will do a more complete view of the, of the microbiome, whereas this will do uh, a, a, a functional look at how the metabolism is being affected by the microbiome. Um, you know, all, again, all these things that you know, taken into context when we look at these tests, a lot of the time we do actually want to look at two or three tests together to get a really good picture, but it's not always needed. We can often get plenty of information from one test by itself. Um, yeah, uh, Thomas, why don't you take us through um, all of the... Yeah, so, uh, markers? I mean, what you see on the left um, is what you will get if you do one of the organic acid tests, right? So, I mean, this is a snapshot of it. And obviously, you need to see your qualified practitioner to understand all of this and a very good one to really make a good interpretation of it all. And a very thorough one to then give you the recommendation and follow up with you. So the idea of almost really is to look at all this and, and to make it all simpler, right? So uh, in, in a way that you can understand. But we look at all those tested biomarkers. So all the things we have seen, so B-complex markers, brain function, carbohydrate rates, fat breakdown, all of those things. Uh, and then all the toxins. So, uh, as I explained, 76 of those organic acid and uh, around 20 uh, or more actually of all the, the different toxins, environmental toxins. Um, so it really gives you a complete snapshot of your metabolism um, and also uh, all, all those environmental toxins that may affect your metabolism and your health in general. So yeah, this is, this is different snapshots, as I said, of, of how it would look from the PDF report. Um, and actually, if you have done one of those tests, uh, and you haven't been on the platform, it wasn't through us, for example, we're more than happy for you to upload that uh, into our platform. So then you can get, which is I think the next slide, um, we'll show you what we have done and, and explain to you, you know, with, with also the, uh, the description and what you need to do about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're adding stuff every day as well. I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm hard at work at the moment, so, adding more and more nuance and complexity to these to make it um, as, yeah. as time-saving as possible. Let, let's face it, we are very, very complex being. Yeah. And I think someone, even the top experts, we need to be humble, like people like yourself are, but you cannot be experts in everything. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. We're we yeah. just, you know, and that's why we need now amazing technology like we have, or, you know, artificial intelligence, all those different things, and put everything together, picking the brain of brilliant people like you, uh, giving your knowledge, but sharing also with someone who is equal, like the Oman uh, experts that we did in Oman uh, um, webinar uh last time. Uh, Sue, for example, one of our yeah. hormone experts, she, you know, all putting all this together and then putting all the connection together, it, it's just amazing to see. Uh, and yeah, we learn a lot. Yeah, but it's, it's all about those multidisciplinary teams, right? That's all the buzzword yes. these days. But it's exactly, it's exactly right, exactly what it should be. This hyper siloing of skills uh, is actually not getting us anywhere when it comes down to improving our yeah. health. So more importantly, let's look at the, how the whole platform so, uh, Thomas, do you want to probably the rest of you take us through this? Yeah, sure. So, you know, very simply, if you do receive the test at home um, and you, it's just a urine sample that you do in the morning, um, and then you get the results um, and you get the results on your platform, and we explain. So, the result overview, you can see where you are at, whether you're normal, high, or very high. And when it's, for example, very high or high, we will explain to you what it means. So we will explain to you, um, actually, there's a mix here between the result section and personalized recommendation, I do apologize. Uh, but you, you have, a, for example, if we take on the left nutritional markers and we give, the, we give you the result explained, which is normally the third one here, nutritional marker, we explain what that means. And if you scroll down, we even give you the ones that you are deficient on. And then we give you, obviously, in the result section, what you need to do about it, what you can do about it. Um, and we obviously give you more of an explanation based on all the other things we know of you. So whether it's from genetic results, from 
your another test that you have done. So for example, if we look at the recommendation section explained on, on the fourth screen here, um, why you should avoid foods with meals is not only because your uh, nutritional markers is, is low. So basically the more foods you have and the, the less they will break down. Well, you, you also need to do that because you have uh, your zinc and copper, copper ratio here um, is also very high. That's from another test. Uh, your fat breakdown rate is also very high. So it's something you need for many other reasons. Uh, and we connect the dots between this. And then we also tell you what to do in terms of supplementation um, strategy. So what is the best supplement for you right now based on those results? Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and uh, uh, we're going to finish off uh, tonight going through a bit of a case study um, that I've graciously been given the permission to share with you guys. And so uh, this is a client of mine. Um, we had, uh, you know, uh, lack of motivation, in high, st uh, particularly for exercise, uh, but in general with, you know, getting getting on top of health, um, high stress levels, um, fatigue, struggled, struggled to lose weight a little bit. It wasn't particularly that overweight for, for this, this person, but... Uh, he was, uh, wasn't sleeping so well and sense of decreasing health. He was particularly worried about uh, toxins in his environment from his past and other bits and pieces of that. So one of the reasons why he did this test. And, and you know, he felt that the metabolism just wasn't working like the same that it used to. So we took a look through a number of things. Um, so profile, profile findings, there was liver toxicity, sort of a, a glycine need. I'll just move my window over here so I can... <laughs> Yeah, glycine phase two uh, sort of needs support, um, excess os oxalates and glutathione insufficiency. Uh, nutritional markers B vitamin B6 and uh, vitamin C were also depleted. And he had some issues in terms of breaking down fatty acids. He needed some support in that. Now, uh, for this individual, I also did a blood test as well, which gave me some additional findings, but I'm just presenting the, the organic acid parts here. Um, now, one part of the protocol, we use a low oxalate diet, um, we plus we used calcium citrate uh, to prevent oxalate uh, assimilation in the gut. Glyce uh, a form of glycine supplementation, it wasn't directly glycine itself for this individual, but we used glycine sort of support, um, glutathione support, vitamin B6 and, and, and uh, vitamin C support, fatty acid metabolism support, which came in the uh, in the function of it for him particularly. Um, in CLA and uh, a time control, a time release niacin supplement um, for particular reasons in uh, what we found in this blood test. We use that instead of L-carnitine, which is a very common thing to use for that sort of thing. Um, liver phase three stimulators. Um, again, we were look, like some of the things that we were looking at in the previous slide and foods aimed at reducing gastric inflammation, which was one of the key things we found from his blood, the right about the, inf the infl inflammation of the mucous, uh, mucous membranes within his intestine. So um, just a little post-recovery phase report, you know, Mark is now getting uh, full motivation to exercise uh, and, and, and uh, he's also started to feel uh, muscle gain, fat loss sort of coming in, in, come into play. Um, and a quote from him is like, I now actually feel like I want to exercise for the first time in years, which was quite uh, quite an important thing. You know, it's it's because it often it's great to see the results, you know, the numbers, the figures change and improve and everything like that. But realistically, at the end of the day, it's how we feel, which is kind of the most important part. Yeah. Of it, right? So, you know, uh, numbers on numbers, but we relate yeah. more with symptoms. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, good to see in black and white as well, yeah. but actually, yeah, the oh, no. body is yeah, back to normal. Exactly, but it's it often that motivation to do things that we know are good for us. You know, we know we want to do them, we know we feel good when we do them, but, you know, it's the, dif the difference between, you know, uh, that, that sort of health and disease, as it were, um, is that, that, you know, that motivation to make those choices. You know, when, when, you, when you, everyone, I'm sure many people can... Yeah, well, yeah, sure. you cannot, yeah, obviously you can actually progress on um, and something that, I mean, most of the, the, the people who are listening here, I'm pretty sure, uh, would qualify themselves as biohacker um, or, or whatever, how you, you qualify yourself. But one of the ideas is really to create really, really this relationship with your own biology and understand what actually you can do to optimize everything. And this is what we can do now and is 
pretty exciting because we, we have this luck of being able to see in details what's happening uh, in a way that can be reported and understood and then being guided on how to, to do that properly yep. within the protocol and then retest and see between A and B what I've progressed on, okay, what is my next sort of top priority. And again, we are very different from a person to another. So it's very important to, to look at our context based on all of the data that we have and put all this together in one place, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, exactly. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's that progression that step by step, I, I always remind people it's uh, you know, literally step by step, you know, one foot in front of the other. That's the only way you uh, you keep moving forward because if you try to look at the end of the of the path, the, the, the big picture goal too soon, it can often you know uh, dis uh, disenfranchise people and and, uh, and and destroy motivation. You know, so it's just about looking at the next small small goal post in front of you. Yeah, where you are now yourself yeah. as an individual, unique individual, and what's your next step? And you know. Yeah. When you do add all those steps, you can go where the res end result is, but your journey will be very different from the person. Yeah. From and, else. and also and understanding different, yeah. <laughs> and it's a good thing. And also understanding that nothing, nothing ever really happens in a straight line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, life happens. Don't you know? Don't be now. Uh, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's move on. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, right. so I think we've got question time now, right? Yes, question time. Um, if you do have any question, and there's some already, but please feel free, there's a little button, um, you can have Q&A, feel free to ask question, um, and we are going to do our best to answer. Uh, I've seen some question already, yeah. um, and uh, there was one to do with genetic actually, um, which was a bit uh, different, but I, I will answer that, uh, and if you want to add to this as well. Um, is about MTHFR and COMET. Um, so it's a bit off topic, but well, sort of, because you have, if you're predisposed, so here you, this person is saying that it's been sort of low MTHFR, so the, the SNP, the, the variant, yeah. um, was not a good variant, uh, MTHFR and COMET. So MTHFR has a lot to do with methylation, obviously, and detoxification, and the same for COMET. But it's again different pathways, and COMT has a lot to do with uh, dopamine pathways, for example, and the neurotransmitters uh, in general. But dopamine, and and yes, you will need to support uh, those methylation pathways, and and you know with all those B vitamins and else. But also in terms of lifestyle, you will also need to make sure when you start feeling anxious, because this is what does when you don't detox those neurotransmitters. Um, to look at ways of distressing and ways of supporting those pathways. Uh, if you want to add to this, Christian, yeah, yeah, no, sure. I'll, 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 can talk I'll, about I'll, this, but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll add a little, a, a little piece. And um, so, you know, uh, if if you have, because basically what we're talking about here is methylation, and we're talking about the uh, the action of of COMT or COMT, and uh, and the various neurotransmitters or pathways it interacts with, which a lot of them will be in the catecholamine pathway for a COMT. Um, so methylation, as I said before, you know, looking at seeing why your methylation may be struggling, if your methylation is struggling in real life. So remember, genes uh, are only part of, the, part of the equation, right? They give you a risk factor, but they don't tell you, actually, are you suffering from that? So do your symptoms agree? Do you're suffering from that? And, do, and have you have you got any biological uh, test results, like ob objective test results that would also agree that you're suffering from that? And then if they do, what do they actually say? You know, do, so it may be a very a very likely a B, B2 issue or, or supplementing with additional B2 will often solve the methylation issue. Now, uh, trimethylglycine, choline by itself, B9, B12, also very, very good uh, potential um, solves that and some people actually have a problem with b7 that's causing a methylation issue you need b2 and b7 adequate amounts to be able to use b9 and b12 in methylation so we're always going to be mindful that it's a larger picture thing now when it comes to com p you know um often something uh vitamin c and copper will often help with speeding up that process but you know we need to see uh, is is that process realistically something we need to speed up 
Um, uh, actually, the Envirotox test or the organic acid test is one of the only good, only only one real ways to look at neurotransmitters. It looks at neurotransmitter metabolites, so we get an indication of how they're being processed. Although it's not a direct measurement and it's not a, a, a you know a, the be all and end all test for that, it's probably one of the the better tests that you're able going to, ever going to be able to access that can look at um, uh, the the uh, Neurotransmitters. So I've just seen uh, viral tests. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. Viral toxin test is one of the tests that you need to look at for. Yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah. and 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 today actually because it's all about viral toxin test. Uh, it's a warm up because it's a very complete test, and we're already very competitive about this test. Uh, you can be charged over a thousand pounds in all these streets easily <laughs> without a consultation. Um, and we're doing that already uh, a lot less expensive. And plus, you have the platform um, environment and also. Um, we're actually doing uh, a code um, which is on viral tox 25, which gives you 25% off um, the test. Uh, and as you can see, you will receive this beautiful box, um, and it's all explained on how. To proceed with the test um, and you will get uh, obviously the, the all the results uh, and if you want then uh, if anybody wants to do a consultation uh, we have a, a 15 15 minute um, consultation and then we have the the 45 minute consultation um, which is 45 pound um, and then 90 pound if you were to look at all the other things as well, um, history and health with our expert, like Christian. So yeah, um, I hope this was very helpful for everybody and everything will be recorded. Um, there was, yeah. yeah. There's, um, there's another thank question. You, yes, thank say, you for thanking us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, there was one question on just on, uh, on how, how to do the test again. So we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but um, yeah, this is a urine test. So this is taken all through urine metabolites. Um, there's no blood or hair or anything else involved in this. This is a urine, urine biotoxin test is urine only. Um, we will be offering blood tests soon, but that's a whole other thing that we all talk about another time. Another thing we, we it's okay, we can, we can, we can say we, we are, we have exciting news soon. Yeah. Um, but yes, we, we, we are going to launch a blood tests very soon and there will be seven of them, uh, blood prick test. Uh, to add to our uh, five existing tests, which are genetic, so the ongoing toxin, the element test, which we are going to do another webinar on the hormone test uh, and the microbiome test. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, seven more tests to, to come. And really, again, thank you everyone. Um, but uh, what I would like to say about all those tests is if you haven't yet, it starts by the beginning, which is the self-assessment. It's very important because, again, it's not about uh, this test particularly for you. It might be something else. However, this test is very complete, so it's always going to be relevant to, to most of us. Um, but if you have many symptoms that are more towards uh, microbiome issues, let's say gut issues, um, our self-assessment will pick this up and will recommend you this test. Um, and that might be the starting point of your journey. So I'm inviting anyone who watching this who haven't started yet the self-assessment, who haven't signed up, uh, you can already get a, a, an amazing insight signing up for free and, and getting your wellness call, which will guide you along the way. So the idea of wellness is really to guide you on what is the next best step for you, rather to follow the trends, uh, because we really look into your bio-individuality and we really try to guide you towards that next best step for yourself. Uh, until hopefully there's no many best steps and, and you just track what is essential. Yeah, and so I've got two, two questions that just popped up. One, um, the Envirotox goes to Portugal, doesn't it? Sorry? The Envirotox test, we deliver it to Portugal? Uh, yes, we still, yes, yeah. I, yeah, I thought so. And um, uh, also, uh, can uh, someone was asking, can they redo the um, self assessments? Yes, we can. Yes. yes. If you can email directly, 
support at omnos.me with, with this request if you feel you haven't filled the, the self-assessment properly uh, and we can reset that and you can start to I, it, was, it was they filled out a long time ago so they wanted to just sort of like yeah yeah definitely it. and it's something that's actually christian you're working on now yes uh, we, we, we we're working as well on this type of as you progress in your journey yeah it makes sense to redo the questionnaire because some symptoms might have disappeared um and some other yeah. symptoms might just be there or, or you know so yeah. so we, yeah, we, we, we are going to add yeah. all those things yeah we will, I'll, I'll be yeah I'll, uh, in in the very near future we'll be producing a new symptom questionnaire which will be which will drive the scoring system as well so we'll be able to get plenty of information from just that free questionnaire by itself but also it'll be something that we'll be regularly able to update automatically in the system and then it will automatically update all your scores in the system with that as well. Yeah. So, and of course, yeah. our upcoming secret, it will come in time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, yeah. thank you, everyone. Yeah, don't tell anyone. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Christian, uh, again. And uh, yes, I wish you all a, a fantastic evening and feel free to ask me a question. Uh, it will still come up. Um, and also feel free to email support at omnos.me. Make sure to sign up and yeah, feel free to be in touch. Speak soon.